Hello and welcome back to Flipped Psychology. I'm Miss Lee and this video is Section 3, Depression and Bipolar Disorder. We are still in the unit Psychological Disorders. Our objective is to analyze the impact of psychological disorders on the individual, family, and society. So we're going to be talking about two families of disorders. The first one is the family of depressive disorders, and it contains a number of different types of disorders listed on your screen. There's major depression, persistent depressive disorder, seasonal affective disorder, peripartum or postpartum depression, premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. We're going to go over the first four disorders in a little bit more detail, but these last two disorders, premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, Basically, this is mood changes, irritability, dysphoria, and anxiety beginning about a week before a girl starts her period. And then you have disruptive mood dysregulation disorder where you see chronic, severe, persistent irritability with frequent temper outbursts. This is typically a disorder found in children. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and grab your notes and let's get started. So we're going to start with major depression. You may recall in one of our previous videos, I talked about the fact that depression is one of the disorders that's found no matter what country we're talking about. Basically, we think of it as the common cold of the psychological disorders. It is very common. It is the leading cause of disability worldwide. In any given year, about 5.8% of men and about 9.5% of women report depression. Major depressive disorder occurs when signs of depression last about two weeks or more and aren't caused by drugs or medical conditions. Signs can include lethargy and fatigue, feelings of worthlessness, loss of interest in family and friends, and loss of interest in activities that that person typically enjoys. A lot of people believe that depression is underdiagnosed and therefore undertreated. Globally speaking, studies indicate that depression is the single most prevalent disability. And while there are some differences that may be a result of reporting, other factors seem to be at work too. These factors have a lot to do with the environment and the conditions that people in that country live with. If you look at the chart to the right of your screen, you look at the lifetime risk of a depressive episode lasting a year or more, and you've got several countries represented here. The U.S. is right there, kind of in the middle. In countries where there is a lower divorce rate, you also see a corresponding lower risk of that person having a depressive episode lasting a year or more. On the other hand, in regions where there is consistent war, you see a increase in risk over a lifetime of having a depressive episode. So those cultural and environmental influences are definitely at play here. So let's talk about persistent depressive disorder. This used to be called dysthymia. This is a disorder that lies somewhere between just having kind of the blues and major depression. It is a disorder characterized by daily depressed feeling. It's a continuous long-term or chronic form of depression. It's basically having a mood where you're kind of down in the dumps all the time. So you see chronic low energy, low self-esteem, difficulty concentrating, loss of interest, sleeping and eating either too little or too much, and basically just an overall feeling of inadequacy. Seasonal depression or seasonal affective disorder. This is where someone experiences depression during the winter months. It's not based on temperature. It's actually based on the amount of sunlight and it is treated very effectively with light therapy. So basically the person is exposed to a bright natural type of light for a period of time and their depression is improved. Then you have peripartum depression or postpartum depression. This is moderately severe depression that begins within about three months following childbirth. It's marked by mood swings, despondency, feelings of inadequacy, and an inability to cope with the new baby. It can last anywhere from two months to a year after the birth of a baby. And part of the problem may be hormonally based. Depression also very much has something to do with the person's outlook, their way of explaining kind of the life experiences. So let's look at the depression cycle. Everyone has stressful experiences but how we explain or how we look at those experiences can be very different. If you have a stressful experience and you explain it in a very negative or pessimistic way, 
it can lead to a depressed mood, and this can lead to further cognitive and behavioral changes. This can lead to further stressful experiences, which continues that cycle. Here's an example of what I'm talking about with a negative explanatory style. So let's look at someone who breaks up with a romantic partner. If you have a negative explanatory style, you might think that this breakup is going to be your new norm, your condition from here on out. You think, I'll never get over this. And you start thinking in very global terms, like without my partner, I can't seem to do anything right. You start to internalize the breakup as being all your fault. And so this can lead to depression. On the other hand, if you think of the situation as being temporary, you think of it as being very specific and that there are external factors at play, then you can experience a more successful coping strategy and have less risk of becoming depressed. So if the person thinks it's hard to take, but I'll get through this. I miss my partner, but thankfully I have other family and friends and it, you know, it takes two to make a relationship work. So this clearly wasn't meant to be. These are more optimistic and positive explanatory styles of thinking, and they are less likely to result in a a depressive state. All right, so the next family of disorders we're going to talk about is bipolar disorder. With bipolar disorder, there is so much more research now than ever was before. We really see some very specific characteristics of bipolar disorder that make it unique and different from any other family of disorders. It used to be called manic depressive disorder, and it used to be linked with depression. However, we know now that there are some biological differences between bipolar and depression. Basically, what you see with bipolar disorder is an alternation between depression and mania, and this can be pretty much the biggest signal that someone is experiencing bipolar disorder. You also see people who are overactive. They may experience feelings of elation. They have little need for sleep. They may be very disinhibited um, in a lot of ways, spending money, sexual behavior. You see people who tend to be a little bit loud, flighty. But what you see is a pattern of whatever goes up must come down. So with these manic symptoms, you then see the other side of the coin with depressive symptoms of being gloomy, withdrawn, inability to make decisions, tired, and having slowness of thought. So you see very polar opposite types of feelings and behaviors being expressed, which is why we call it bipolar disorder. Continuing with bipolar disorder, the part of this disorder that is going to express mania has maladaptive symptoms such as a high level of optimism and self-esteem, but also recklessness. Milder forms have free-flowing thinking and can fuel creativity. What's really interesting is when you look back over history, many great writers, poets, and composers suffered from bipolar disorder. It was during their manic phase that they were the most creative, where they wrote the most, where they composed the most, and it was not typically during their depressed phase. Walt Whitman, Virginia Woolf, Mark Twain, whose real name was Samuel Clemens, and then Ernest Hemingway. When we are looking at the brain, we can look at differences that actually show what is happening with the brain during the different stages of bipolar disorder. PET scans show the brain energy consumption rises and falls with manic and depressive episodes. So you see a series of brain scans on the same person experiencing different phases of bipolar disorder. So you see much less consumption of energy or glucose in the depressed states and much more energy being consumed during the manic states. There's also definitely a biological factor at the neurotransmitter level in both bipolar disorder and depression. A reduction of norepinephrine and serotonin has been found in depression. And what we see is that drugs that alleviate mania also reduce norepinephrine. So very interesting implications for drug therapy there. Suicide is the most severe form of behavioral response to depression, and each year some 1 million people commit suicide worldwide. You do see some national differences, some differences between the races, the genders, age, and different situations. So take a look at the chart that you see on your screen. Contrary to popular belief, people 75 and older actually experience higher rates of suicide than any other group of people. Can you hypothesize why that might be? Okay, so briefly, let's look back over what we talked about in this video. 
We talked about the impact of psychological disorders on the individual family and society, specifically the family including depression, as well as bipolar disorder. In our next video, we will be discussing schizophrenia and the dissociative identity disorders. I can't wait to see you then. Bye for now. Thank you.